James at 16 will not be presented this evening, but will return next week at its regular time. Stay tuned now for a special two-hour, What Really Happened to the Class of 65. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Look who's back, everybody. It's Mark Guggenheim. Welcome back, bud. Thanks, man. It's good to be back. It's good to see you again. Uh, honestly, man, I was thinking about this as I was watching the Alex Ross commercial. Uh, everybody, if you got to have a long limo ride from a convention to an airport, you want Mark Guggenheim with you. because uh, <laughs> Honestly, you know, it's so funny. I was telling Art Balthazar that we were talking. He's like, oh, you know, we had really fun with him when we were was, little, sir. And I'm I like, yes. I don't think anyone's ever had more fun driving to an airport before. Um, that was a blast. That was a, I tell you, had had that van or that limo got hit, um, a lot of comic book people uh, would have would have you know gone down. Like it, 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 it would have not been a good situation. Who's that Alex Ross guy? He looks amazing. I, I I know he's he's, he's, he's got, got a future. future. He's got a future. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> pretty amazing. I'm absolutely with you, man. Hey, right off the bat, we got a comment from Jared saying thank you for your support hey. of the Writers Institute in Albany. Hope to oh, see you. Wow. Back. What's that? Tell us about it. So the Writers Institute is uh, an organization that operates out of my alma mater, uh, University of Albany, um, and. They're an incredible organization. They they support you know all writers of all stripes really, um, but definitely up and coming writers and uh, just a wonderful wonderful organization. Thank you uh, for that shout out. That's awesome. Um, uh, I that really makes my day. It's really nice. There you go, man. That's terrific. So I asked uh, Mark if he knew my uh, TV show interruption promo that I played. I don't know if you remember because uh, you you were like close. You're yeah. younger than me. You are significantly younger than me. Or at least we share the same decade, you know. So we, we definitely share the. T- I did not catch that show that was preempted for tonight. Um, it was uh, James at fifteen. It was Lance Kerwin from mm. uh, Sal- Salem's Lot and a million other things. Yeah, and then uh, it promoted this one season show, but I loved it as a little kid. It was called "What Really Happened to the Class of 1965," and it was like considered almost like a dark Animal House, although it took place in modern time. But they would open the yearbook, and here was the popular cheerleader, and here was the brain, here was the nerd, here was the jock, and what they're doing now in the like you know ten years later. I, I love that actually. That's a cool idea for a show. Um, that's totally you know. I tell you, there were there were shows back then that just like just ideas that just you know so, some never caught fire, but like you were like, oh wow, they really swung for the fences there, and they they came up with a cool idea. It wasn't all like. 
you know, murder of the week, you know, patient of the week type of shows. There was there was real stuff, you know, being tried. Oh, God. You know, honestly, Mark, uh, I don't know if you ever met Rob Burnett, um, who's a big uh, Star Trek nerd. Um, I do. No. Well, he and I will like talk about especially and uh, given our, our nerd uh, love of various things uh, from the 80s. Was it Otherworld? Where I the- loved Otherworld. Love that show. Actually, yes. that show, Saturday Night. Amazing show. That was terrific. Um, yeah, very, universe, CBS. Very far ahead of its time. The, the guns were like <laughs> upside down. Like, <laughs> you know, the, it, it like, it was a gun like this. And I didn't like, even remember that. That's fantastic. Oh that's, yeah. that, uh, that's like Father like, Sarducci on SNL going, yes. you know, there's the parallel earth on the other side. The only difference is they eat corn like this. <laughs> the cabbage that I like this. <laughs> it, that show was awesome. Um, and yeah. as I recall, and I was pretty young when it aired, it, it, it felt like the production values actually were pretty good for yeah you know, for that kind of show and that kind sure. of era. Jonathan um, Banks, uh, uh, pre Wise Guy, and I know you yes, uh, are Wise Guy, of course. Of uh, that. I met today. I, I can't talk about what I was meeting about, but I actually met with uh, David Burke and Stephen Cronish today. Um, they're the, they're the Paul and John of wise guy. And, uh, it was cool. It was, it was really cool. Wow. Cool. And it's awesome because they are, they're always like two seconds away from taking out a restraining order on me. Um, just because I, I know the show in a way that quite frankly, someone who didn't work on the show shouldn't know the show. Um, but they're lovely guys. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was fun to, to sit and talk with them. Outstanding, man. Um, well, you know, all right, that's an entry into us talking about the WGA and everything that's okay. happening with the strike. Um, you know, yes, I probably I probably should say we were not talking about anything that would be covered by the strike. Um, so uh, we were all very well behaved. Um, but uh, but yeah, let's talk about this this WGA strike. Um, it's a thing. It's a real thing, um, and you know. I, I have a lot of, you know, as, as one would imagine, I have a lot of complex feelings about it. Um, but the the bottom, bottom, bottom line to be very reductive about it is, you know, this strike is a strike about can you be a writer without being independently wealthy? Um, that's, you know, that's really unfortunately what we've come to. It's very, very sad to sort of say it that way. And, you know, it's funny, the, the Writers Guild, you know, when we announced the strike or when they announced the strike, they said that, you know, we're trying to keep writing from being a gig economy. And I was like, ooh, is that messaging? Do I like that messaging? Is that smart? And I, here's the thing. And the reason I was asking that question was, you know, I always talk about like, hey, I got a gig. I got another gig. You know, everyone writers talks about gigs. But, but what they meant was they were, they were saying, can you be a writer without having to have a second source of income? That, that's what they meant by gig economy. You know, the, no Uber driver is, you know, only an Uber driver unless they're like retired, let's say. And it's like, you know, and I, I know a bunch of Uber drivers uh, who are retired. But like, you know, if you are a writer and you, you know, want to make a living doing that, you can no longer do that without some other secondary source of income. And that's just wrong. This is this is not a gig. This, you know, we call it a gig, but this is a profession. It's a craft. And this is a job that shouldn't require someone to have to drive an Uber you know, or work at Starbucks or, you know, my personal fantasy being at the Genius Bar in an Apple store. Um, <laughs> you know, that that's my plan B. But I, I, you know, that's, you know, that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about like, how do we become, you know, uber wealthy or crazy rich we're just talking about how we scratch out a living and you know i i do this semi-weekly uh substack newsletter called legal dispatch and a couple of weeks ago off of conversations i was having with people on the picket line i i basically sort of let the studios in on this dirty little secret which is i know we keep saying it's about compensation but here's the thing we we already do a lot of this for free um, so you might ask, well, if you're already doing a lot of it for free, or you're willing to do it for free, then what, what's this bullshit about like, you know, needing compensation? And the answer is, well, the idea that we'll do it for free is premised on the assumption 
that what we're doing is creatively fulfilling. And I, this is the deep, dark secret. It hasn't been for a lot, a lot of writers for a very long time. Um, so as I like to say, you can treat us poorly or you can pay us poorly, but you can no longer do both. Um, and that's really where we are. Um, now, obviously, the minimum basic agreement, the MBA that we as a Writers Guild have with the studios, there are organizations called the AMPTP. Obviously, we're not going to negotiate, you know, contractual points about like you can't know things to death and you can't give bad notes and you've got to respect the creative vision of writers, though it'd be lovely if we were doing any of that. Um, it, we, we can't negotiate that stuff. So what we do negotiate is things like, no, you know what? If you're going to hire a, a writer on a TV show, they've got to be able to stick around through, you know, production and post-production. They should be able to get experience producing and defending their episode on set. They should learn what it means to be in an editing room and, and how the sausage gets made there. Um, you know, we're, we're telling people you've got to be able to get paid what you're actually worth and not have everything stretched out and taffied out to where you're really only making minimum, where showrunners are making less money uh, than their story editors. That's just not right. It's not fair. Um, we're not getting paid for the work that we're producing. It's so wrong on so many levels. And I keep hearing from people like yourself. I was telling you off the air, I think, you know, Chris Cantwell brought up stuff that you didn't bring up and Howard Chaikin and people like that. And I hope to continue to talk to more of you that I know that are both writers of comics and writers of, of television and film. And like the mini writer's room, can uh, you expand on that, uh, what that is? Because yeah. it's something that's, you know, because also in fair, I mean, I, whether it's fair or not, you know, you'll see an award show and the win and the Emmy goes to the writers of Late Night with Dave, David Letterman. And 20 guys write, you know, write, run up to the stage. And I don't mean that in any pejorative way, but it's like, that's the truth. And so when you, you hear mini writer room, what, what's going on? So, yeah, so that's a great question, actually. So basically what the streamers have decided to do in order, I think they're doing it to save money, but the truth is I think they're really just doing it to, you know, have greater control over the end product is before a show is ordered to series, before they will green light a show to actually be produced, what they'll do is they'll hire a mini room. Uh, and they call it a mini room really as a way of justifying the paychecks also being mini. Um, and it's, you know, it's the showrunner with a couple of writers who will really do the heavy lifting. Um, there's nothing mini about the work that's being done in a mini room. In fact, the gestational, generational, true, like, rubber meets the road type of work is actually being done in the mini room um, because it's in those it's in those weeks spent on that mini room I hate that term um, are actually is when you are developing what the show is in series you know the the showrunner may have written a pilot they certainly have pitched a pilot but what they haven't figured out is well what's the whole show and that's what that mini room is doing um, even though they're like, you know, breaking and writing episodes two, three, and four. But in order to break episodes two, three, and four, you have to know what five, six, seven, and eight are. So suddenly you're doing all this work for the entire season. You're being paid less because it's a mini room, even though the work is anything but mini. Yeah. And you're also doing it without any expectation that the show is actually going to be produced. All this, you know pre green light work is you, you do it and you have no idea if the show is going to go. Um, and you have no idea if you are working in these mini rooms, if the show does go, if you'll be asked to return back. So it, it's, it's fundamentally problematic in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, so one of the things the writers guild is looking to do is saying, well, first of all, let's not, let's stop calling it a mini room. Cause that's just stupid. Um, it's a pre green light room. And like anything that's pre green light, for example, a pilot, um, that, you know, a pilot script, just a little inside baseball information for people who aren't familiar, a pilot script is, is paid at a premium. Um, you know, you can be paid up to $500,000 for a pilot script, whereas a normal episode of television, television is anywhere between $26,000 and $30,000. Now, I recognize that when we're talking about these obscene amounts of money, um, 
you know, it's be like, God, what are you guys complaining about? Um, the answer is, is sort of twofold. Number one, um, you know, not every writer gets paid five hundred thousand dollars to write a pilot. That's a very high echelon of writer. Sure. The the other thing is is that the the fact that the pilot is paid more than an average episode that just simply reflects the reality of the work. You're developing the show. You're creating the characters. Of course, you should be paid more money than that. No one, you know, goes onto a a car lot and says, "I want a, you know a BMW." for Honda Civic money. Um, you know, it, it, you got to pay things what they're worth. Also, we, we and I, and luckily, you know, no one's saying like, oh, writers are being greedy um, because, you know, it would be impossible to say writers are being greedy for one simple reason. Um, first of all, the development process has been taffied out so long that that $500,000 may actually be for two and a half years, three years worth of work. Um, so that, that's one thing, but also if we're going to talk about, you know, someone being overpaid, I think that conversation, and I'm saying this not as a writer, but as an American, that conversation has got to, got to, got to start with the amount of money we're spending on CEOs in this company, in this country. It's just, honestly, it's perverse. It's, it you know, it's, it's French revolution type shit. No shit. Yeah, you man. Know? No, it's that one, it's the, you know, 1%, the 99% were, uh, demonstrating about 10 years ago. So no, yeah. I get it, man. And, Absolutely. And, and just to be clear, you know, when you're talking about like that 1%, you're talking about some people with generational wealth. You're talking about some people who really did earn their keep. When you fire, there are CEOs who get more money for being fired than other people who get it for being employed. Yep. The, the golden parachute has actually become a diamond encrusted platinum parachute it's it's completely ridiculous the the ceo of amc network I, was on the job for i'll be conservative and say she was on the job for 10 weeks you know where severance was 10 million dollars she got paid a million dollars per week for getting fired wow to which i say fire me please yeah no shit Good you boy. know so uh, we, we really just, this is, I, I think, a, a fundamental problem in the country. Um, we've got to do something about it. Amen, son. No, you know, I mean, and again, I've seen it in broadcasting uh, on the radio side, yeah. you know, for, for 20 plus years here in Chicago. So, no, I know what you mean, man. And again, I mean, as you know, when I, when I got out of college in Chicago alone, there were 25 places to work. And now there's six if you're bilingual yeah if you're not bilingual they're four and it's and that's just in chicago where we still have several dozen radio stations but they're all owned by a, a small amount of companies and i know that's the case in tv and film and uh you know yeah the the again the one percenters uh continue to uh prosper and and yeah i mean god as you know when our dads were working oh. class men um, you know, it was like, okay, the CEO made an arbitrary number 10 times, maybe even 15 times more than the janitor. Okay, whatever. But, but now it will, literally, it's hundreds. It's hundreds. orders of magnitude. And, you yeah. know, you talk about, you know, when you, you talk about the number of stations, you know, going down, that's, that's because we've decided to treat antitrust laws as less laws and more like suggestions. Yep. Suggestions we don't really even follow. I mean... I, look, here's the thing. I, I love Disney. I love 20th Century Fox. I love, 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 let me be very clear, love the idea that Kevin Feige is going to get to make an X-Men movie and going to make get to make a Fantastic Four movie. But you cannot tell me that Disney buying 20th Century Fox is not monopolistic behavior. It absolutely is. It yeah. violates every bit of antitrust law we have in this country. Again, super glad that it's happening in this one instance because I want to see Kevin Feige tackle, tackle the Fantastic Four, but surely there must be a way that we can accomplish that without violating all the antitrust laws we, we have in this country that, quite frankly, have kept the you know, competitive spirit alive. The, the antitrust laws exist not to be anti-capitalist, but rather to be pro-capitalist. Indeed. And, you know, to make this for the same reason we've got rules in football and baseball we have we have rules to make the sport an actual sport. 
You get rid of the rules and you might as well forget the sport. It doesn't matter. Same thing with capitalism. Uh, you know, you, you, you wipe away all these guardrails and it's not real business. It, it becomes something very, very different. And uh, I, I think we're all now starting to see the consequences of that. And, you know, I, I, I was, you know, a writer back in the 2007 strike and this has been very, very different. And I, I said this in my sub stack also back in, in 07, you know, um, Teamsters and IOTSI drivers would drive past us on the picket line and you would watch them stick their finger out the window and it would just wow. like this. And now they're actually honoring our picket lines. And you got to ask yourself, well, what's changed over 15 years? And the answer is, is that the IOTSI and the Teamsters and SAG and DJ and all the other unions, they recognize that, number one, this is not about us trying to get more. This is about us just trying to hold on to what meager crumbs we have, number one. Number two, these are not problems that are unique to writers. You know, when I when you talk yeah. about meeting rooms, when you talk about span protection, those are those are very you know technical terms that are only affecting writers. But the larger issues that we're striking over, that affects not just everyone in Hollywood, it affects everyone in America. You know, we're we're being squeezed the same way. You know, a, a, a television, you know, a, a television, uh, you know, cable person who like literally lays the cable <laughs> is affected. We are, our, you know, the people who maintain the equipment, the people who drive trucks, the people who, you know, teach in schools, who work in hospitals, you name it. Like everyone is being squeezed by this incredible corporatization of America. Agreed. You know, it's it's just got to stop somewhere. Sorry. That's no, 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 no. Mark, again, I, this is what I wanted to hear. It's fair, and I want you, and I, people need to get the right perspective on what's going on. And I told you this off the air, and I'm happy to say it on the air. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the Screen Actors Guild because it merged with AFTRA, which was the television and radio guild. And uh, we're all one big happy family now. And I got the postcard. Do we authorize for a strike? Yeah, I don't think it's happened yet, but I certainly put my vote on yes. I think, yeah. uh, I think it's this week. That the deadline is. Well, actually, I love your, your deadline comes up two days uh, before you start the negotiations with the studios. Um, I, I, I've heard about this postcard thing, and I'm, I'm actually fascinated by that because I, I love that SAG has asked for a strike authorization vote, an SAV. I'm a little concerned that you guys are getting postcards. Are, are you supposed to mail it back to 1992? No, no, no. It was just it was just a direct mail reminder. Oh, okay. Okay, and I I'm also did get I also did get I got an email reminder as well. Um, yeah. no 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 know. it's a modern it's a modern uh, thing. But okay, no yeah. it just kind of I think it was kind of the opening salvo prior to the emails of yeah. hey this is coming. Yeah no and I think be really aware of it because it's in a week or two and it's like hey man you already got my vote don't worry yeah. no and I, I don't know, I, you know, one of the, again, big differences between uh, today and 2007 is we were joined by a lot of actors on the picket lines. And uh, I haven't met a single actor who isn't uh, voting yes or hasn't already voted yes. So it's really big difference. I've been loving seeing on, uh, and again, it's, it sucks that you guys, ha you know, I mean, you're doing the right thing. You're, you're, you're trying to get your, your word across and everything. And the demonstrations in front of Netflix and the studios, the streamers, whatever. But yeah, it's been it's been great to see the actors come out and come out with donuts or come out with coffee or whatever and really, you know, show their support. And I've seen the selfies yeah. that a well, lot of you on the line. What's very exciting actually is, you know, first of all, another big difference, huge difference between now and 2007 is we have snacks this time. We did not <laughs> have snacks. We didn't have snacks. And um, you know, I'm actually very excited for when SAG, uh, I, I've heard, this is a rumor, so I can't confirm it, but I've heard that, you know, uh, right now, you know, writers, we have donuts on the picket lines, but I've heard if SAG actually goes on strike, there will be Ozempic pens. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. I, I hope that the Ozempic pens are shared the same way the donuts are shared. Outstanding. Um, oh, yes. my God. Are those um, stories that like certain I mean, actors are like? Hey, I can't. I I don't speak for SAG. You know, <laughs> I've but, heard too that uh, some actors have like made deals with local restaurants and stuff, and it's like, 
hey, just show your WGA card and they'll give you a free meal or whatever, which is great because again, you're not these are these are people, these are employees yes. that aren't even making a, a, a reasonable middle class wage. Well, by the and way, just shout know. out to Drew Carey, who he's he's paying for a restaurant in the valley near the lots and a restaurant uh, on what's called on the west side near the lots. Um, he co- he did this back in 07 uh, and he's doing it again. He not only covers the, the tab, he actually also covers the tip. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Good point. Generous, um, and uh, hats off to Drew that's uh, writing a, a literal blank check because this thing could go on a, a long while. So um, that's uh, he's he's a uber mensch. Hey, man, uh, really, this entertainment starts with story and character. And we certainly know, especially people who watch Word Balloon, uh, because we talk to writers and artists and stuff. It starts with you guys. And I mean, it's it's the truth. And um, that's why it's like, hey, man, we really we're in the midst of other than this strike, you know, for the last 20 years, a new golden age of television where story has changed and i mean i you know we we talk about some of our favorite shows you know from the from when we were kids and stuff like that no tv is different in the best oh, yeah. ways and it's like a hey, the people that are making this stuff they deserve it that, that you know it, we're just we're not even asking i think for what we're due we're just asking for as much as we need to be able to get by right I mean, to not have to do a second job. No, you put it out with women. That's just right. so, you know, it's just so reasonable. Look, I mean, I don't expect everyone else to be a workaholic the way I am. I, I don't want people to have to take on my workload to, to get, you know, to get by. Um, you know, it, and it's just about being treated with respect. That's really what it comes down to. I'm with you, man. Um, yeah. Here, let's, uh, let's transition to comics. Because really, honestly, Mark. I really appreciate it because, as I told you, oh, no, and I appreciate you giving me this this forum, and I appreciate the support and everything. It's my uh, intent, and everybody that I know that is affected by this get it gets a chance uh, to talk. And oh, here we go, you know, Brad, Brad, right out of the box. Here we go. What a coincidence, Marcus. On, I was just reading your Han Solo Chewbacca comics today. Fun stuff. Did you ever read the Brian Daly Han Solo books back in '79 or '80? I'm betting yes. Uh, uh, well. Not only yes, but I don't know if you can see them. I want to like rotate my computer, but I, I, I'm pointing to my shelf, which still has my copies. Um, yes, I actually love, love, love them. Um, I mean, I'll date myself here, but you have to understand, you know, back when I was a kid, like there was, you, you had Star Wars, but it wasn't Star Wars like we know it today. It's it was a movie every two to three years, and in those you know lean times, you had the Marvel comics and you had the Del Rey paperbacks, yep. um, and, and that was it. <laughs> there, were, there were no video games. There were no, you know, um, you know uh, there, there was you know there was there was no Andor. There was no Disney Plus streaming of Star Wars. We had we had we had the comics, we had the books, and we had the Star Wars holiday special. Indeed. You know, uh, so, yeah, actually, not only do I, I love the Brian Daly, but of course I'm blanking on the, the name of the author who uh, did a similar trilogy with Lando Calrissian. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, just absolutely uh, adore those books. Again, still have yeah. my copy. Hey, man, uh, you know I'm like that with Star Trek, and we'll get to yeah. Star Trek, but those James Blish short story adaptations of the original yeah. series – and then, and that's the great thing, man. I don't know Brian Daly's pedigree beyond the Han Solo adventures. No, neither do I, which is weird, isn't it? That's strange. I, I, yeah. But you know, yeah. you know, you well know James Blish, a very accomplished oh sci-fi God. pulp writer, and Alan Dean Foster did the animated uh, adaptations. Well, and, and, and and to sound like David Car- Carvey when he was the old man on SNL, we loved it. You know, it was we like, did. Oh, oh my God, God man! Yeah. You were excited. You know, um, Splendor of the Mind's Eye by Alan Dean Foster is like, I, I loved it. I mean, you have to look back. There's a little bit of a creepy scene with Luke and Leia before. Well, yeah, they didn't they didn't have them as brother and sister when Alan wrote it. So, yeah, you know. Nice to say, yeah. yeah. Um, but fantastic. Yeah. With a gorgeous Ralph McQuarrie uh, cover. Um, I mean, just, yeah. uh, you know, I, I remember actually my my fifth grade teacher gave me that book. Wow. And I was like, oh my, I just devoured it. It was so great because 
just the idea that again it was it was like it was when you're young everything i guess is eye-opening it was eye-opening to see these characters that i love so much in a different medium 100%. you know and i know that that sounds so reductive it's like oh you were you're you're you were impressed by the invention of the wheel but back then it felt like the invention of the wheel come on man absolutely and like you said there was so little you so know little. You the comic strip as well i suppose but yes so I, I, I love the comic. yes you, i i was actually i i feel bad i left out the the uh the the archie goodwin al williamson comic strip is unbelievable i yeah, mean man. simply i mean i know russ manning had had done it before but to me you, you, is it russ manning am I, am I wrong about that I didn't um, remember Russ Manning doing it, honestly. I remember Williamson. But and Williamson, it, you know. like, just friggin' killed it. I mean, the most gorgeous art. Um, do you have you know, uh, Do you have that oversized soft cover? I don't think they made it in hardcover, where it was all of Al Williamson's Flash Gordon stuff. Oh, yes, I do have that. Um, I, oh. I, 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 have, I, it's funny, I actually kind of have almost everything I could get my hands on about Williamson, because I, I love to spend Flash Gordon – um, I have the, oh, yeah, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Yes, um, indeed, Russ Manning um, uh, did do it. I have the, uh, one of my favorite things that I have is the uh, IDW Artist Edition of Al Williamson's adaptation of Empire Strikes Back. Sure. That thing is friggin' gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah, he um, was the man. It, it bumps me out, man. I never got a chance to meet him. I don't know if you did. Me neither. No, uh, I, ne I never got the chance. And, and he was so... Um, he was one of my all-time all favorite artists growing up, quite frankly. 100%. And his uh, adaptation of the Flash Gordon movie. And yep. you know, it's funny. Now, generationally, nice. this is where we, you and I might differ. Because I was in high school when it came out. And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Because honestly, I was oh like... My God. Loved, I didn't... I'll be honest. I wasn't in on the joke. I didn't appreciate his camp. Uh, I just exactly. loved it for what it is. Um, and uh, I, I'd be remiss if, while we're talking about Al Williamson, his Blade Runner adaptation is friggin' gorgeous as well. Yeah. No, the you guy know. could do it, man. And I mean, you know, he was one it. of the original EC artists. Good Lord. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh my I mean, God. We, were, we were lucky to have him as long as we did for as many decades and stuff. No, the guy oh. was incredible. So, incredible. but on to your Han and Chewie book and everything. Um, yeah. Now, now, you know, forgive me, man. Uh, it took a lot of like begging. But finally, Marvel put me back on the press list. So hey. I've had a gap between I because I have Marvel Unlimited. So I'm I'm like you know five months behind, uh, and I know issue uh, ten as I've got the cover uh, just came out. I want to say or I, I know the writer. So if you hook me up with your your address, I could probably get him to send you a copy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's that's the cover issue ten by Phil Noto, who has been our cover artist for the entire series. Incredible. Um, yeah. and it just, you know, this has been such a blast to do. It's, it's been, it's been so much fun. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And it's, it, the, that book is kind of been the gift that keeps on giving because it connects up to things that are going to be happening in the star Wars books, um, down the road. Um, so like Dark Droids, uh, which is the next big Star Wars crossover, you know, the you can trail events of that back to uh, to Han and Chewie. And, and you know, the, that's I mean, even if I wasn't involved, I would still be really, really enjoying what they're doing with the Star Wars line, because it's like the old school Marvel Universe, you know, where. Everything is connected. You don't have to buy every single issue. Um, but if you do, you really do see a very cohesive, very tied together universe the way, not to sound old, but the way things used to be. Um, before the line got so big, it was impossible to connect. These are like five books. And, you know, again, you don't have, you know, we're very conscious about like saying like, look, we don't want to have to force anyone to buy anything they don't want to buy. Um, but if you if you do buy any combination of the books, you're going to see connections the way things used to be. And it's it's really cool. It's like this is, you know, to me, it's one of the things that I've loved about comic books, the interconnection between all these characters and all these books. 
and you know that's that's what's happening and it's uh it's a lot of fun is um so are your stories i know this uh current han chewy book is set before the events of new hope is that yes. where the events is this is prior to new hope for dark droids it, yeah so uh, no no dark droids is actually taking place in sort of the what I'll call the main timeline right now. The main timeline right now is the period between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So even though Han and Chewie takes place before A New Hope, it still lays the foundation for things that happen in Dark Droids, which happens, you know, a, a, shall we say a movie later. Um, okay, okay. That's, what's, you know, again, what's kind of fun about it. Um, and, and, it's it's just it's it's a blast. It's it's a it's fun to see all these little connections. Um, again, if you are inclined to, you know, if you're if you don't want to spend the money, that's cool too. No, I get it, man. And and you know, again, we'll we'll get to Star Trek, and I could say the same thing in terms of the cohesive universe. You guys are doing at IDW. Uh, yeah. Brad agrees and says the new Marvel Star Wars line is my main comic reading, and Thanks, he Brad. says. And Pete says, and I know this, I haven't seen Phil, and obviously COVID is part of it, but I haven't seen Phil in a show in at least five years, if not more. And he is such a brilliant and sweet guy. And and so, just kills it. Every cover just kills it. So I mean, yeah. I've not only I've not only got the example of uh Han and Chewie, but I've I've got uh, one of his Yoda covers uh, handy yes. as well. This yes. is him, isn't it? This is, this is. Uh yeah. I'm so lucky, yeah. like, you know, uh because you know, Phil's doing the covers for all the Yoda books as well. And I, I'm lucky because I've had a chance to work with with uh, Phil now on three, four, if you want to count Star Wars Revelations um, projects, because he also was uh, the cover artist for a good chunk of my X-Men Gold run. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I feel like I've got one of the Phil is like one of the people I've had the most close collaborations with and have done the most work with without ever having met. Um, oh, wow. One of these days. One of these yeah, days. Yeah, man. Oh no, it's inevitable. Absolutely, man. Do you yeah. own, do you own any original art of Phil's? Uh, you know what? I don't. My wife actually very rare. Uh, my wife is actually encouraging me to spend money. She really wants me to reach out to Phil and, and get one of the Han and Jewy covers, which I should really do. It's a little hard to spend money right now because there's this writer strike. Uh, yeah, I heard about over. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but that is definitely on my my wish list. No, I understand, man. I absolutely understand. You know, it's funny. I, I want people to know because, you know, I've, I asked people for, you know, uh, help with Patreon as far as Word Balloon goes. While I am a Screen Actors Guild member, I have not had a broadcast job because of the economy, the post-COVID economy, you know, yeah, since since 2020. And, uh, you know, Word Balloon continues because of the uh, graces of uh, supporters of uh, Word Balloon, whether it's uh, my, my paid sponsors or... Uh, the patrons, the League of Word Balloon listeners. So thank you very much. But I don't want you to think that, you know, uh, the dilettante here is, uh, you know, uh, lighting his cigars with $100 bills. It ain't happening. Well, well you, I mean, look, you, you can't even afford electricity. Exactly. <laughs> You're right. Well, I'm I'm actually talking to you from uh, the bridge of uh, the Enterprise G, as we saw. In the ooh, ooh. Because, uh, That's no, harsh. No, 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 I'm like, because my, yeah, listen, I loved, I love season. I know, I do too. I, I understand. You know what? I, 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 straight up, I realized, and I realized just early on and I embraced it. Okay, that was a choice. You know? Yeah, that of was course. Oh, absolutely. And I, I actually respect it. No, no, and I it does look it. cool, but I just keep saying, you know, I, I do the alien uh, movie uh, poll line and go, in space, <laughs> nobody, nobody pays the light bill. And it's kind of true. Yeah, that's true. It's very, very true. Yeah. yeah. Hey, it's how you uh, it's how you save money. Exactly. I was gonna say the Federation keeps warning, uh, threatening to shut us off, so we got to conserve power. So absolutely. Well, there you go. There's a nice transition. Let's, uh, dude. I am so thrilled that you're doing this uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture series, uh, Echoes, and it it's like you know, let's say it's the next day or the next week after. The V'ger incident is over. And also the aesthetic, and this is more your artist, although I'm sure you were for it. I just love not only their pajama uniforms, but uh, the AM FM car radio that they oh. seem to have at their waist, which is just, you know, oh. is there room for a CD? I don't think there is, but it's, it's, it's so, fantastic. I just love it. And I, I, I happen to love that look and I love that aesthetic. I don't know why, um, but I do. Um, and I love that IDW and Paramount were cool with us embracing it. 
And it, you know, it, in many ways, like the Star Trek comic that I grew up on was the Marvel, you know, post motion picture Star Trek. Sure. You know, I mean that that was, um, you know, that that was my introduction to Star Trek in comic book form. Okay. Um, and uh, I have great affection for that whole period. Um, and they've they've let us they've they've not only let us um, they they've not only let us uh, you know embrace that look, but somehow someone's probably going to lose their job for it. I got away with referring to the uh, uniforms as pajamas, um, which. And quite frankly, it's like if you're gonna do it, like I gotta get that in somewhere. I just I gotta get that in somewhere. Um, so it's yeah, it's funny. It's like I I think, you know, I, I read you know look, dirty secret. I read reviews. I I do. I'm I'm not one of those writers who who has enough self esteem not. <laughs> and, and someone sort of pointed out that the writing in the first issue is is funnier than Star Trek the motion picture, and to that I do plead guilty. Um, yeah, uh, that's good. You know, well, you know what it is. Uh, well, well, first of all, I'm like, if you're thinking that after the first issue, just wait, because once I, I saw what to get away with with the first issue, it just gets goes off the rails from there. But that's the me. My my Star Trek is the movie Trek. Um, you know, I had seen bits and pieces of the original show, but it was really motion picture. That was my first full on exposure to it. Wow. And you know, and Star Trek, you know, two and three. Um, looms so large for me, and and so I'm I'm basically writing. I'm trying to write in the Nick Meyer, Harv Bennett style of Star Trek's two, three, and four. Um, what with the old costumes, um, so you know maybe that's wrong. But if it's wrong, I don't want to be right. So um, I'm with you, man. No, and also it's it's fine because the first movie is getting the band back together. And, yeah. you know, this was, De I mean, as Kirk enters the ship, his old crewmates are now Decker's crew. Yeah. And, and, yeah. It, and it is a different mindset. And, um, and, you know, does, you know, I mean, they're thrilled to have Kirk back in the chair and certainly they're going to do their best, but Kirk is unsure of himself. Spock is still post colonar cold oh as hell until this feature moment. Now this is on the way to where they are in Rathacon. Where yeah. you know the cowboys are back together again, and they're they can relax around each other and stuff. Yeah. So no, I think I think it's welcomed and makes sense. It, it just I couldn't help myself is yeah. is God's honest truth. Um, well, and and I really did have a lot of fun with that because also it's like for me, you know the that you know what I call the the Nick Meyer Hart Bennett, uh, you know voice was all the characters they they've been with each other for so long now they're in on the joke, you know, that, yeah. that kind of like, it's, you know, they, they, they know that Kirk is, you know, a little pompous and, and breaks the rules at every opportunity. And Spock knows that everyone thinks he has a stick up his ass and, you know, yeah. McCoy, you know, is a curmudgeon and like, and they just all know each other so well that to me, the, the essence of, of that period of track. And, and I think, to me, the essence of any any good track is when the crew starts to feel more like a family than a crew, um, and that to me is is very much the crew of the Enterprise at this point in their their history uh, together. So um, that that you know, I just leaned into it, and and you know, um, if I'm going to be criticized, I certainly want to be criticized for being you know too funny and not funny enough. I respect that. The other thing I like too is the attitude of Starfleet to Kirk. Yes, assuming the captain's chair, and you got that one admiral who's like, you know, hey, you know, it's great because Kirk. I mean, sorry everybody, read the issue, but Kirk starts a conversation much like Picard in season one with the admiral that tells him to fuck off. Yes. Uh, but it's like, hey, uh, Jennifer, you know, whatever. Uh, that's Admiral Jennifer, and she's yes. like, well, you know, I'm an admiral too. Well, you're not acting like one because yeah. you're sitting in the it's captain's chair. Right. That great line about this is the problem that we encountered. Is something that the Starfleet operations should handle. I'm in charge yeah. of Starfleet operations. Hey, no, you're not. You're in the captain's chair <laughs> and you're fucking around in the galaxy. We need you back here. And that's great, man. It's just like Thank Captain you. Shaw in Picard season three, where, yeah, he's yelling at our heroes and she is yelling at our hero in this case, but she's not wrong. Yeah, and that's no what's great, means. man. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well uh, um, Admiral Muhammad uh, makes a return in issue four. 
okay. with and her conversation for is with Spock. Ah. And um, I, I she has some line about you know you, you know you're you're you know um, you know, it's something about a shit storm or something, and and Spock is like, I'm unaware of any weather related events involving excrement or something along those lines. <laughs> um, and it's just Spock being like using his Spockness to just shut her down. Sure, um, and it's it's a it's a grand old time. Oh, that's oh, <laughs> Brad. Brad goes, and this is interesting. I know, I think IDW released a collection recently, but he says, if you're interested in reading the Star Trek Daily Comic Strip, I have a friend who's been scanning them and posting them to his Facebook comics uh, and funnies group page in chronological order. God, that's great to know, Brad. Oh, I, because- that. You know, I actually, I didn't, wa- I didn't read the, the motion picture, you know, newspaper sure. strips, um, but I know that they, they collected them. IDW, I think, collected them. Yeah. Um, and my, I, Marty Pasco, my good friend Marty, was the writer of that series. Always wanted to buy those and, and check them out. Um, yeah, you know that's on my uh, that's on my post strike. You know when I've got money uh, uh, list of things to buy. <laughs> that's great, man. Well, I've I've told Jackson and Colin and Chris Cantwell uh, how much I've enjoyed the the IDW run, especially lately, and even Mike. I don't mean to say even. Mike Johnson, when he was writing the Kelvin comics, oh. also were superior. Frankly, I'm saying this superior to the movie series. I, Mike's stories are a hell of a lot better than I those. Love, I love his countdown. Um, his countdown to the 09 yeah. movie, fantastic, really yeah. fantastic. Well, and, it filled in the blanks. I mean, it really yeah. and it connected in a great way. In a in a way that actually Kelvin. yes. Yeah, in in a, in a way that that solves some problems, some story problems. Agreed. Um, I, I, Agreed. I mean, all props to Heather Antos. Um, you know, Heather is is putting together this just murderer's row of artists and writers and colorists. You know, I- incredible people doing, I think, some amazing Trek stuff. You know, Heather was was you know there at Marvel, very instrumental when Marvel you know got the Star Wars license back, and you know, again, all the things I was talking about. Um, you know, with Star Wars, you know, she, she deserves a lot of credit for, you know, helping develop their workflow and, and, and how you, you know, you, you have a licensor to work with and, and all that stuff. It's none of this is, is easy. Um, I think, you know, and Heather makes it look super, Heather makes something very difficult, look very easy. Um, and she's, you know, I mean, when was the last time, maybe ever, never, um, you know, Star Trek got nominated for an Eisner, you know, much less two. Um, you know, this is, this is not happening by accident. Um, you know, so I'm just super glad I was able to blackmail her into letting, letting me join. Um, you know, so did uh, you pitch her? Did she come to you as far as, you know, I'll tell you, Ashley, it's a good question. So Chris Allo, um, who I've been working on a a project with that's that's heretofore unannounced, he, he reached out to me, um, shortly before New York Comic Con. He said, do you like Star Trek? I'm like, do I like Star Trek? Um, what name a line? Name a line from Star Trek two or three or probably four, and I can tell you. I can recite all those movies by heart. I, I and, dude, I do the same thing. Believe me, I know. I, I think I scare the Paramount folks sometimes. Um, and uh, he's like, "Well, you know, um, have you ever met Heather uh, Antos?" And I'm like, "Actually, you know, it's fine. We our paths never crossed while she was at Marvel. Um, I love her Twitter feed. I know that's like a." A, you know, but like for Twitter feeds, really great. It's always very positive and creative and everything. Uh, so we met at New York Comic Con and she uh, and I like, you know, I I, I, I don't want to say we hit it off because that implies that she liked me as much as I liked her. Um, <laughs> I don't want to it, um, but um, she was very kind. She she said, look, I have need for, you know, a, uh, you know, like a original series crew pitch. Um, I asked, would it be OK if you know, again, my, my TOS is really, my TOS crew is, is the movies. Can I pitch the movies? She said, yes. And, uh, I sent her and Paramount a couple of springboards for a bunch of different ideas. And, uh, this is the one that, that they were most intrigued by. So we were off to the races. It's great that your sweet spot is between the motion picture and wrath of Khan. Cause that's a nice little place to play in. And then Chris and uh, Jackson and Colin are playing in that post nemesis, post DS9 period, or I shouldn't say post DS9 period. Yeah, pre 
pre yeah. pre nemesis. Yes. Yes. And that's great because it really does give them room to play and yeah. the things they're able to do. And same thing with your story. I don't necessarily want to spoil the main plot unless you do. The first issue has been out for a couple of weeks. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story about my attitude about spoilers. So back when Star Trek 3, this is an old spoiler, folks. Um, back when they cut the trailer for Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, Harv Bennett and uh, Larry Nimoy... Uh, went into the head of uh, Paramount, Sherry Lansing's office, very upset, very upset, because they showed in the trailer the destruction of the Enterprise. And Harv and Leonard were like, you know, uh, uh, you can't do this. This is uh, this is going to be a surprise. This is a big shock. We're, we're sure. destroying the Enterprise. You can't show this in the trailer. And Sherry said, well, tell me, boys, would you rather the audience be surprised or would you rather the audience see the movie? And... Suffice it to say, uh, that shot's in the trailer. And I, I have always sort of been guided by that uh, for the most part. Um, certainly guided by it for, for Trek. So basically, um, the, I, the idea behind it was I, I, I wanted to, to do a parallel universe story that didn't involve the mirror universe, but not for the sake of doing a parallel universe story. What I really was interested in doing was telling a story from the perspective of characters who are not crew members of the enterprise. Um, because we're, we're always, you know, every time we see Kirk and company that, you know, we're telling the story through their eyes. Yes. And, you know, we'll occasionally, you know, tell the story through their eyes for sure. But I wanted to all offer an alternative point of view, um, especially given this time period where, you know, we, we, this is a very unexplored time period and we don't, you know, know too much about what's going on with Kirk and the rest of the crew. There's a lot of questions that at least I had about, you know, Kirk is brought on to, you know, help solve the V'ger crisis. He takes a temporary grade reduction to captain. But now what? You know, uh, he draws, um, you know, you know, he draws McCoy out of uh, out of retirement. You know, let me explain what happened. Your revered Admiral Nagura invoked this little-known, seldom-used reserve activation clause. In other, in simpler language, Captain, they drafted me. Like and he's got the he's got the Eye of Agamotto uh, disco oh, medallion. Like, it's beard, it's like the beard itself is its own character in that movie. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, what does this mean? You know, like you would think that both Kirk and McCoy would be off the enterprise the second the V'ger crisis has passed. Sure. And yet clearly they're not because it's and, hard and to do that. that but, uh, as, as I hear chapels in MD. Yes, I don't well, need a doctor. Right. Uh, who, 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 I, don't, I, I need a first class nurse, not some other doctor who's going to uh, debate every diagnosis with me. That's the thing. Like, <laughs> and I wanted, doc, I wanted Dr. Chapel to be, uh, a presence here and absolutely featured prominently in issue one you know, absolutely um you know and in issue one she definitely gives mccoy the business um yes yeah. look mccoy's an asshole um ah, he's a ah. little of an asshole don't get me wrong but he's an asshole um, well i hope christine has a moment where it's like you know leonard i took your shit for five plus years or whatever it was i'm an md too fuck you <laughs> She just like, <laughs> likes to give it back to him, you know. Um, so she's, you know, she's a great deal of fun. There, there is going to be a medical crisis um, coming in, in, you know, towards the end of issue three. So um, we, we've got some fun things, you know, uh, in store. Okay. Well, based on what you said, you didn't want to necessarily reveal uh, the the uh, new or the yeah. Oh, the new I, yeah. Set. So basically, so basically, um, the there's a someone who is sort of like you know, out of a very non-Star Trek kind of space opera um, who shows up on the Enterprise and, and she's hunting this terrible war criminal. Well, the the woman doing the hunting looks a whole lot like Uhura and the war criminal is Chekhov uh, or Chekhov's doppelganger. Um, so they're, you know, and there's, there's fun to be had, um, you know, with, Uhura, um, of, you know, of course, if you're going to do this type of story, Uhura and her doppelganger have to switch places. Um, ah. You know, Chekhov's reaction to the fact that there's a, a doppelganger of him that is, you know, the equivalent of Joseph Mengele uh, is, you know, it's just it's it's a great deal of fun. And, and 
one of the things that I, I'm probably most proud of uh, is, uh, you know, I think the biggest challenge with the Trek movies was in two hours, how do you give everyone a moment to shine? And, you know, in five issues, I, I truly believe everyone gets, you know, at least one moment to shine. Usually it's a lot more than that. Um, and we get to see, you know, interactions with characters, you know, Uhura and, and Kirk um, are working together very side by side for much of the series. You don't often get to see that, um, you know, tried to create like a dynamic between Sulu and Chekhov that again was, was very underserved. Um, you know, watching Spock deal with Starfleet brass um, as well as uh, the Romulan empire is uh, a delight. Um, so there, there's, there's fun moments to be had um, sort of throughout the series. Outstanding, man. Well, you know, uh, all right, issue two is come out in just a couple weeks, mid June. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, that's great, man. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, I feel like actually each issue gets better and better. But of course, you know, I'm neurotic, so I, I'm a little terrified because the reviews for the first issue were so uniformly great. Uh, I feel like there's nowhere to go but down. Um, but I do think <laughs> it actually get better. Uh, you know, as, as oh, the series. I'm sure. No, there's more story. Absolutely, man. Yeah. All right. Before we go on to something else, we talked about this the last time we talked, your collaboration with uh, Chaikin. And yes. uh, Brad wanted to know if you have any new plans for Simon Cross stories or something else with Howard. You know, it's funny. Actually, Howard and I do need to talk about, like, you know, uh, do we do a, a Too Dead to Die, you know, follow up? Um, I The only thing I can say right now is that we're, you know, we, we sold uh, the rights to Universal, um, Universal, uh, we're, we're, you know, the strike, you know, right before the strike, I turned in my latest draft of the screenplay. Okay. Um, so, you know, my, my hope is that without me, it's moving forward and, um, but the, the draft was very well received, which was really, really nice. Good. Well, here's hoping, man. Absolutely. And I would imagine if a film is greenlit, then we will get more. Awesome. So, you know, there you go. Or regardless. I mean, I'm for it regardless. It was a great, great graphic novel. Everybody should uh, pick it up. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about the X-Men. And obviously, as you said, you had your previous run. But yes. uh, tell me about this Days of Future Past thing that's coming up. Doom so this, this has been a blast. Um, so basically, uh, I was approached um, by Marvel. Um, the... the, the Assignment is theoretically pretty simple. It's tell the first, you know, tell the 30, 30 years that lead up to the events of Uncanny X Men 141 and Uncanny X Men 142. I'm with um, you. Which is, is all well and good and very exciting until you realize that 30 years is a lot of time to cover in only four issues. Wow. Um, so there's, there, that was a challenge. Like, I, 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 a fun challenge, but definitely one where, I had to certainly pick my spots. I couldn't include every moment, every, you know, uh, thing that I want to do. One, one thing I might do, I have to talk to Marvel about it, is there's, there's unlike a lot of comic books that I've written, there's a lot of material that ends up on the cutting room floor. Um, and I have a lot of scenes that are like entirely written um, that uh, if with Marvel's permission, I'm going to like publish on my, you know, in, in my newsletter. Oh, that's um, great. There's some good scenes, you know, there's some, there's some you know, um, you know, uh, th things like Rogue, you know, making comments about uh, how Magneto drops the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants uh, from, uh, you know, he calls it the Brotherhood. And I, I think I had some line about how, like, yeah, got rid of Evil Mutants, but it's it still kept the sexist term. Um, <laughs> um, so the misogyny lives on. Um, That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe you know, try to find some life for those for those cut scenes. Uh, because oh, that's the, great. You know, um, Jesus, and then, you know, um, but but what I realized my approach, what I what I settled on was I kind of wrote it the way you would write a crossover event, um, where you're you're really telling the big pieces, the big movements of the story, uh, and you're jumping obviously, we're jumping a lot of you know, time and years. Um, and, but at the same time, there was like, there's quiet moments too. Like, um, one of the things that, you know, uh, we cover in issue one, I, I wanted the discussion of how is it that everyone hates mutants, but everyone seems to be fine with the fantastic four. 
you know, the Avengers are beloved, but the X-Men are hated. What What is up with that? You know, um, so there's, you know, actually two scenes, I think, that sort of speak to that. Uh, there's, there's one, I think, very powerful scene where um, Spider-Man is attacked by a bunch of anti-mutant haters um, who they don't know he's not a mutant. You know, he sticks to walls, he shoots webs. Sure. They don't know those mechanical web shooters. Um, you know, that they, they have every reason to think he's a mutant. And um, what, what happens when Spider-Man is attacked by, by regular, basically innocent people? You know, they're, they're obviously bigoted and they're, they're, they're mistaken in their beliefs in a wide variety of uh, matters. But what happens when, you know, Spider-Man is, is forced to hit people? Um, and suffice it to say, it, it doesn't go well for him. Um, you know, he, he, you know, I think Spider-Man's biggest weakness is his conscience. Uh, a lot of times and, and yes. you know turns out to be the case in in this it's a really powerful scene um you know and we've got you know in in x-men 141 uh kate pride at that point uh she's no longer going by kitty uh sure. tells peter that that they had kids that were killed um you know we, we explore that um you know uh, there's it's it's a the the thing i tried to do was to write it from a perspective of you don't have to have read X-Men 141 or 142 um, because as, as beloved and iconic and, and incredible as those two issues are, they are published, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I don't want to have to expect people to, you know, read a comic book from 30 years ago. So it, it all is designed to stand on its own feet. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's really about the nature of, not just prejudice, but how the norms of a society really break down and all the compromises, you know, we make um, and it, sort of the, the slow creep of fascism um, is, is really what, you know, Ma Magneto had in issue one has a very powerful, um, you know, speech. I think it's a powerful speech sort of having been there, having speaking, you know, speaking from the vantage point of history and having lived through the Holocaust, uh, he, he is able to predict uh, what is going to happen to mutants uh, with far greater clarity than Charles Xavier can. Um, so it's, uh, you know, hopefully it's, it's powerful. It's, you know, it, it still has some, you know, X-Men high adventure. There's, you know, there's punching and hitting and, um, you know, and the, uh, the end uh, of the series um, answers some questions. Um, for example, we, we know from X-Men 141, 142 that the world powers were going to nuke North America. Um, and we know from the post uh, Days of Future Past continuity that that didn't happen. But no one ever explained why. How did the X-Men, you know, prevent uh, essentially World War III? Well, we're, we're going to answer that. You know, that's the thing, man. Um, a lot of people don't like... Listen, I think prequels sometimes deservedly will get a knock. But but one of the ones that I disagree with is, well, we know where the story is going to end. So therefore, why bother with this? And as you know, and as I know good writers would say, it's not the destination. It's the journey of how we get there. And there I, is a story to be told. I, I will say, I generally do hate prequels. Uh, I, I am not a <laughs> Um, the prequels I like are the ones that do answer some questions. Um, you know, I think Rogue One is a great prequel. You yeah, know? I and agree. And Rogue One was was very much sort of, I wouldn't say it was the comp necessarily, but but I, I went back and I rewatched the movie in preparation for this, really to sort of see how they um, square the circle of telling you a story where theoretically you already know the outcome. Um, and also in, end on a note of hope. In fact, the last word in that movie is hope. Absolutely. Um, you know, and also that's a movie that stands on its own feet. You don't have to have seen A New Hope in order to ha appreciate Rogue One just as a piece of cinema. Oh, so, no, children now um, discovering the Star Wars saga will start with Rogue One and will learn yeah, as they're older. Yeah. What do you mean this was made after New Hope? They don't, they don't know. Yeah, right? yeah. no, it, I mean... Cool. It's so well done. I mean, I, I love Rogue yeah. One. It's yeah. one of my favorites. Well, and you know, Godfather 2 with its prequel yeah. moments is a mm -hmm. great movie. I mean, it's the thing. It can be done. It doesn't it can, always happen that way, it, but it can a, be done. 
it's a special kind of storytelling, you know, yep. uh, with its own with its own challenges. And, and there's a there's you know the 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 end of it, um, which I'm writing the fourth issue now, but I've already outlined it, so I know okay. how it ends. Ends on this moment of, oh wait a second, like th th this story can go off in a a direction that you know I didn't necessarily expect. So um, hopefully there's surprises in it, um, you know, to to be had. Has it started or um, is it coming? No, no, it's not out yet. It's out. Okay, I wanna... good. Because I, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Yes, now no. That I'm back on the press list. <laughs> yes, and I'm the worst writer in the world. <laughs> Yeah, Twitter. Lee, I I've read my timeline. I I know a lot of people agree with that, but I, I'm the worst writer in the world insofar as that I'm horrible at publicizing my stuff. And one of the reasons I'm horrible at publicizing my stuff is I don't uh, know when anything comes out. Um, so I got to educate myself. I think it's it is this month. I know it's. I'm pretty sure it's June. This month. I think no, so. No, I literally just gave notes on the on oh. the first two letters. So well, I want to say it's July. August, actually. Oh wow, August. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of time. No worries. Okay. Well, uh, you've sold Brad. Brad says he'll check it out. Sounds great. And uh, I agree with Peter Beiser. He says, of course, Andor was pretty special, too. Yeah, I love Andor. More, more than pretty special. Um, yeah, man. I would say one of the best star pieces of Star Wars content out there. I am so with you, man. Especially, I really love the intergalactic politics that we got in Andor. Yeah. I mean, I love all the stuff that's happening uh, as far as, you know, the prison thing and the rise wow. of the rebellion, but really, I, I am I am very much about those West Wing esque uh, moments of politics, intergalactic politics. I'm all for that. I think Andor works really well, um, even if you don't uh, know Star Wars. It's you know, it, to me, that's the non that's the Star Wars property. I I recommend to non Star Wars fans. <laughs> um, I gotta ask because again, I read this on your Substack. And I had no idea. And I'm going to another before we get to Torrent and we will get to Torrent, I promise you. But I had no idea that you were trying to reboot L.A. Law. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I, I, for people who are looking mostly a new cast, but right next to each other towards the left, two from the left, you got Corbin Burnson and you got Blair Underwood, uh, yeah, who yeah. clearly are reprising their their roles on L.A. And, Law. And, uh, Jill Eikenberry was in the pilot as well. Um, okay, she's not in that photo. She because she's not in that photo. Okay. She these are the lawyers in the firm. Uh Jill Eikenberry, her character and Kelsey uh got promoted to uh, to judge. So, oh wow, that's great. <laughs> is there is there a I mean cuz I mean the the great thing about YouTube is, you know, sometimes these uh pilots and stuff will find their way on YouTube. Can we see it anywhere or no? Uh, no, unfortunately. Oh. Um, I mean, look, I would love it. Nothing, nothing would make me happier uh, than sure. if, uh, than if someone were able to circumvent the Disney attorneys. Um, but uh, <laughs> alas, um, you know, it's uh, it, in fact that photo that you just showed. I, I took that photo. That photo is off of my iPhone. Oh, there you go, man. That's great. No, you really you link in your latest Substack. It, I hope it's the latest. It was one from. May 19th, everybody. Yeah. If you're if you're following Mark or intend to follow Mark, which I absolutely recommend. Legal Dispatches is uh the title of uh, Mark's uh, substacks that he does when he does his newsletters. And he links to this fantastic interview with another writer who's like, Tell me about you know your attempt to reboot LA Law. And clearly this was a passion project. I don't mean to bring up old oh, no, it's, I, I've actually like kind of made my peace with it. It took a while. It took you know, it's it's been a it's been a little over a year. They passed on on wow. May 13 of 2022. Um, so it's a lot of therapy uh, and a lot of <laughs> a lot of alcohol and a lot of tears and a lot of everything. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I've made my peace with it. I I think you know, in, in many ways, I the version of LA Law that I love is the version of LA Law that I tried to make and. That's not the type of thing you're going to see on television today. Um, you know, we, we well we had a we had a very black and brown cast. We had a trans cis same sex relationship. We had an argument about slavery reparations, uh, abortion. Um, it, you know, it, we you know it's just not the kind of thing that um, I think you know, you can, you can do on television these days. Um, I certainly made the mistake of trying to do it all at once. Uh, 
you know, in a single pilot, I should have, I should have eased the network and eased the audience uh, into it a little bit more. That's interesting, Mark, because honestly, I do think that, I mean, God, we're even seeing it in the Arrowverse, the amount of uh, characters of color and, yeah. and gender and ethnicity and everything. Um, so yeah, you would think that TV is trying to at least, you know, support those ideas. I think, you know, one, one thing I say a lot is I don't think uh, I realized or, or in general, we realized how good we had it with the Arrowverse. Um, you know, we, we were able to, to do a lot of things, um, you know, in terms of diversity, both in front of and behind the camera um, it, that quite frankly, uh, I, I got used to it. I, I got used to being able to, um, you know, tell stories of all different kinds of people. And um, I kind of forgot that we were we were living in a, a very rarefied bubble, uh, you know, over in the Arrowverse on the CW. Um, so, uh, you know, wow. I, I take the blame. Uh, shame on me for not being realistic, you know. Well, but also that role of a fifth network. Fox had this as well in the 80s and 90s when there were only four networks yeah. that it would afford you the opportunity to, to go there and try and get as many viewers that maybe aren't being served by the big three or now the big four. So I, you know, maybe that's, I, I don't know. Again, that's just supposition on my part. Well, when I pitched, you know, when I pitched uh, the show from the very first, you know, pitch, the very first meeting with the studio and then the network, it was, I, I basically, I actually start off with a little history lesson about LA Law and how they did a Black Lives Matter episode before there was even that term, how it had the first lesbian kiss on television, it had, had the second interracial kiss on television, um, how they did an episode about flag burning and they burned the flag on camera. Um, you know, th to me, that's all in the DNA of the show. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, admittedly, they didn't try to do that all in one episode. And that's probably where I where I went. Wrong. I hear you. No, I hear you. God, no, it was one of my another one of my favorite uh, 80s shows. Absolutely. man. Again, we were we were watching. It's uh, it's funny. Uh, Dom, Don, uh, one of our commenters said, you guys like too much of the same shit. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. We're the same generation. Yeah, guilty. Guilty is, two nerds, guilty. yeah, two nerds living in uh, opposite ends of the country. But no, enjoying the same shit, man. Absolutely. So, right. well, all right. Well, moving on, because I do want to talk. I hope I hope we're okay for time. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, excellent, man. Uh, obviously, I want to talk about Torrent as well. You're four issues in. Give people the elevator pitch on Torrent. So the elevator pitch is, imagine if Spider-Man became the Punisher. And, and you know, what would that take? What, what would it take to turn Spider-Man into the Punisher is, is basically the, the elevator pitch. Um, and... It's funny. This is this is a book that has been getting really amazing reviews. Like, um, I, I'm always blown away every month when we when we publish it. How, you know, people are really really digging this. Um, and yeah, I, I think in part it's because Justin Greenwood is just doing amazing amazing work as he always does. Uh, Justin and I. This is our third collaboration. We just really, you know, get each other. Um, and, uh, we, we also are, you know, be, because we're dealing with, you know, there's no sacred cows in this comic. It's, you know, it's not like we are, we have to protect any of these characters for, uh, you know, future movies or TV shows or sure. 50, 50 more issues. So really, I think when you read it, every issue, you don't know who's kind of come out alive. Um, there, there really is a sense of unpredictability about it um, and very much baked into the concept and by design. And I think the other you know, thing that's kind of fun is if, if you're familiar with my work on Arrow, um, uh, there are, I'm returning to a lot of themes that uh, were very attractive to me when we were doing Arrow. Um, the, you know, the, the line between what's a hero and what's a vigilante, what's uh, a vigilante and what's a villain um, and, and sort of how all these identities really exist along a spectrum and a continuum uh, where there, are, to the extent there are even lines between these categories, they're very blurry and they're very, uh, they're, they're very permeable. Um, so I, I like to play around with all this gray. Um, and issue four is, 
just a it, it's it's just a completely balls out crazy issue. Um, it really, really is. It's it's you know it's it's where I think we take some of our biggest swings. Um, I remember like finishing the script for issue four and sending it off to Justin, being like, I might have gone too far with this one, um, but uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. I think if if you're someone who's been enjoying the series, uh, this issue will really really take you by surprise and kind of you know set you up for the finale in issue five in in a way that you really don't expect um you know and i'll, I'll sort of spoil a little bit and just say that issue five begins completely differently than how you expect um it, it's you know it, it, i guess you know the the most uh the most non-spoiler way i can put it is michelle metcalf the protagonist um she has to really double down on her vendetta um, at the end of issue four coming into issue five. Um, you know, she has to really, she has to make a very, very, very stark, but dispassionate choice that she has to live with. She's not gonna be able to look back on and go like, oh, I wasn't in my right mind, or I, I didn't take time to think about it. No, this is very reflective and um, stuff that happens in, in issue five is, uh, well, I, I don't want to ruin that, but uh, again, I, I think people will be quite surprised, especially if you're familiar, you know, with we're, we're playing with a lot of superhero tropes, but we're sort of using those tropes against the audience's expectations. It uh, issue four drops tomorrow, everybody. Yes, it does. Uh, that much I do know. See, I know yes, that. There you go, and I did as do I. So, <laughs> but yeah, so you need to catch up on this. It's it's great, and uh, I don't know if you got anything else coming up, uh, creator owned. Uh, Let's well, I do. Um, there's I don't know what's there's what has been. yeah, there's there's one creator own book, uh, that is, is we're just finishing up with the, the everything's done. Um, I have to do basically like my final pass on the colors and uh, the letters, but once we have that all finished and ready to go, we'll announce it. Um, I was just approached by Marvel to do a uh, another four issue series that's not X-Men and not Star Wars. Um, and I have a four issue Star Wars series that is not announced yet, but is announced, will be announced imminently. I just, just did the interview uh, for starwars.com. So uh, oh, very good. got some, got some stuff, you know, up my sleeve to announce uh, in the next couple of weeks. Will you have room for more Star Trek beyond this original series? Uh Yes, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, but Heather yeah. Heather approached me with an idea um, that really excites me. Um, so I've been working up, you know, I, when I start any new project, I, I first just start by working longhand and sort of doing a brain dump uh, on on a variety of different ideas. Um, but But this would be, I will say, a a rarely seen, rarely if ever seen corner of the Star Trek universe um, that is a lot of fun and, and actually has the potential, I think, to be really, really cool. And if I, if I do it right, it would, it would span time periods too. Wow. Um, so I would get to play around with a bunch of different eras of Star Trek. Um, so I've, uh, you know, a very, that one is a long ways off because I have to, I have to come up with it and I have to pitch it and it's got to get approved, but, uh, that's been a lot of fun to, to work on. And, uh, I was just relieved that, that Heather didn't feel like, uh, she made a mistake by hiring me to do Star Trek in the first place. Ha um, will you, uh, in the future, once the strike is settled and everything, would you pitch to Paramount? Have you? Pitch to Paramount. Oh, I have it. You know, I would love to. I mean, God, I would totally love to. I mean, that would, that would be a dream gig. Um, you know, it's weird. I, I have this strange uh, difficulty moving from the comic book side of my career to live action and the live action side of my career to comics. Um, it's a little, little strange. Um, oh, am I still there? Yeah, you're here. I can hear you. Oh yeah. So yeah, I, I, you know, so it's it's funny. It's almost like I think Hollywood sees there's two different Mark Guggenheims, um, and uh, one writes comics and one writes live action, and and you know, no, it's the same guy. He's just tired. That's all. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but, uh, you know, it's funny, actually, like doing the two dead to die screenplay. That was the first time I've adapted my own work. Um, wow. Yes. And that was that was like, you know, after years of basically saying in interviews and the comic book conventions that, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, you can't do a literal translation from one medium to another. Yeah. You know, and that things have to change, take advantage of the, of the medium. Um, uh, I was like, oh, here I am hoisted on my own petard. I'm basically being asked to walk my own talk. And, uh, you know, so suffice it to say, I will tell you, the, the uh, screenplay of Too Dead to Die is it's similar in the sense that the themes and the concepts are there. Um, but the story is really quite different. Um, so, you know, I, I, I actually lived up to my own pronouncements, which I'm, you know, uh, at least if not proud, at least not embarrassed by. Well, dude, honestly, well, long before I got to know you on a, on a personal level and stuff, I, I've always appreciated your writing oh, and, oh, you. Well, you know, it, man. I mean, God, uh, Eli Stone really, you know, blew my mind It's a great legal show. I'm sorry. It didn't last longer than it did, but at least we got, you know, a, a decent number of episodes to acknowledge and appreciate. Do you know what killed that show? Tell me. The, writer, the writer's strike. There you go. I thought so. Oh, seven. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Bitter irony. Absolutely. And here we are again. Uh, yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, listen, obviously, when we had the last episode of Flash last week and stuff, and, um, you know, you had left the Arrowverse a couple of years ago with Legends and things and the crossovers. But yeah, any, any postscript thoughts? I mean, is it too soon? You to- know, it's funny. I've been thinking about it. Well, I'll tell you. So like last week, you know, which was the, you know, the, the finale of Flash, it was also, it coincided with two things. It coincided with Greg Berlanti's birthday and it's coincided with Superhero Day at the Warner Brothers lot. And, you know, uh, wow. a bunch of cast members from the various Arrowverse shows came out to support. And I saw, you know, a lot of people involved with all the shows and, you know, it definitely had me like sort of thinking like, oh, this is, you know, this is the end of a, an era. This is a real, a real passage. And I've been, I've been debating, I, I probably will say something about in, in my sub stack. Um, but what I've kind of learned, which is, which will make for a very unsatisfying sub stack is I move on really quickly. Like I, I'm, I'm all about like the next thing. Um, Good. Having spent a lot of time, it's just not my nature to spend a lot of time thinking about what was the the one thing that I I really am left with may surprise people. It was it was the environment. Um, you know we you know look you know we had challenges with another writer uh, who shall remain nameless. Um, but when you know when he, when he wasn't involved and we were able left to our own devices to create an environment of you know of not just respect and and decency but fun. Um, we just had fun, like, and we all like look back on those times and go, oh, that, that was fun. That was fun to do. And, um, I, I think more than anything, I, I miss that. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm glad that we got to do the things we got to do and tell the stories we got to tell. But if you're, you know, if you were to ask me what I'm going to miss, it's, it's the people, you know, I'm not going to miss like, you know, all, all the, you know, the comic book stuff is fun. It's fun to, like, try to do Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's fun to, you know, realize some of these characters and concepts in live action. But the the part that I look back on with the most nostalgia and the most, you know, uh, wistfulness, quite frankly, is, like, I just miss going into work every day and seeing these people. You know, that that's really, you know, that that's the bummer. And I think we all, I don't think we all, Sometimes we did, but we didn't always really know how good we had it, you know, and, and it kind of goes back to, you know, what we were saying about L.A. Law versus, you know, the Arrowverse. I got so used to, you know, yeah, you you know, you you want to have this character be gay, have this character be gay. You want, you know, this character be black, this character do this, this character do that, like whatever, you know, um, you know, we were able to tell the stories we wanted to tell. Um, and that's, that's a rare experience. I hear you, man. I had uh, 10 years at a sports radio station here in town, and that's exactly the same thing that we talk about now 15 years later was the amount of fun that we had, and it was just a pleasure to go to work every day with that group of people. And you're right. You don't appreciate it sometimes when you're in the eye of the storm, and uh, now you can reflect back and stuff. So that's 
that's good to hear. And again, it's hey, it's it's a big accomplishment, and um, it'll be interesting to see what the next chapter is because you know that uh, Warner's is certainly not done. I mean, obviously, um, you know, James has his slate of stuff that he wants to do, and he's teased us, and we'll see what develops from those uh, initial uh, pitches and everything. Yeah, and look, I, you know, I really do approach these things as a fan first, so I'm just looking forward to it. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the Flash movie. I'm looking forward to, obviously, seeing what Gunn does with Superman. Like, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, to me, I'm just going back to, you know, the guy I was before the Arrowverse, which is fan, you know? Um, yes. So I'm, I'm there opening night. Would you, do you still have friends at DC, and would you, would you come back to writing any DC comic universe stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, it's funny. I was I was actually um, emailing with Jim Lee about doing something. Um, oh, good. Yes, yes. In fact, I'm like, oh, I owe Jim a reply. Um, yeah, I, I would love to to um, do something uh, in DC proper, and um, I just have to kind of figure out what that is. I, I did recently come up with the idea of a Batman comic that I think could be really interesting. Um, so I got to. Uh, you know, I, I got to get on that. Um, it's, you know, I will say it's, it's very hard. I'm having a much more difficult time being creative um, during this writer strike than I was back in 07. Um, this is harder for some reason, but uh, you know, still now I've got plenty of time. So make use I of understand that. And Hey, listen, you know, uh, this is, as you know, it's that downtime. And when your brain finally relaxes, that's when the cool stuff hits it. I Mike, agree. Mike, uh, Mike Nichols, Nicholson May, yeah, uh, the great director and stuff. That was the one kernel that I took when he did Inside the Actors Studio and talked yeah. at length. And he's like, you know, it's that downtime. And people think you're being lazy. Not that anyone's accusing oh. you of this. <laughs> but, but he's like, he's like, that's really when you can finally relax. Yes. Whether you're on the treadmill or you're in the shower yeah. or just doing something non-writer normal, that's when the ideas hit you. And that's when the creativity sparks. I know that in my limited creative output of Word Balloon and when I have a weird idea and want to make a parody of a commercial or a parody of a song as I used to do in sports radio. Yeah, that's when that's when the cool shit happened, man. So yeah. it's cool. Okay. It'll come. Yeah. No, no. I'm, I'm trying to be patient. Absolutely, um, man. Brad, uh, here, Brad says something nice here. And shame on me because it is one of your things that I haven't watched yet. But he says, hey, man, I still watch Troll Hunters. And he's loving your Star Wars comics. All the best you. to you and uh, the folks on strike. Absolutely, man. Uh, thanks, Thank man. You. I really appreciate that. The, the check is in the mail. Um, <laughs> really um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, the support's been great. Really, really, really great. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not likely to be forgotten, uh, by any of us anytime soon. Dennis also uh, says he's been enjoying a uh, torrent. Thank you. So, yeah. Love thank you. Justin and I, we, we love working together. So, um, hopefully more to come. That's excellent, man. And Brad also says loves G Justin's artwork. So right. Good, Everybody, everybody's on board, man. Well, dude, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I, Same now. You know, are you going to do any conventions uh, this summer? You know, uh, I've been talking, uh, you know, I, I've been talking, Spencer Beck, our mutual friend, uh, I, I was talking to Spencer, like, I, I got some time here now. So um, I I was going to do Heroes Con, but but I'm actually uh, going with my family to Europe, so I'm going to miss that. Oh, nice. Uh, but uh, I got to find something, um, you know, uh Obviously, New York Comic Con for sure, but that's still a ways away. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I, anyone who's organizing a convention, <laughs> reach out. Well, and also the other side, I am really interested to see what San Diego looks like because I have a bad feeling that the writer's strike will continue. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, no, I think that, I, look, I think I think it's not pessimistic. I think it's realistic to say that, that – the writer's strike will not be resolved before San Diego. Um, I'll be curious to see how, you know, how it impacts it. Um, yeah. you know, that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. Especially also, by the way, if, if SAG is also out on strike, um, you know, that'll probably even have a bigger impact, quite frankly. Agreed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be, 
It's a shame also because we're just emerging from COVID. So, you know, it's a bummer. Yeah, man. Honestly, no, my, my, my heart goes out to you guys because you're right. I mean, really, even if you didn't have COVID, just those three years have really fucked us all up in such a really way. I'm, yeah. I'm rewired. I mean, I, I it sucks. But yeah. yeah, I mean, you really are fighting to be normal again. And then you guys on top of that have to worry about your livelihoods and, yep. and being normal. So no, I really, I mean, we all, you really, you know, and I mean, this is the great thing about, this is where social media is good. And I think a lot of the nerds are absolutely on the writer's side and will be on, on the other guilds as they support this initiative to just for fairness and, and for the ability to do your job in a comfortable way. And like you said, not have to work at Starbucks or another job. I mean, that's, again, this is, this is a, it's a creative and profitable um, line of work that deserves the compensation for the amount of money the one percenters get from it. It's that basic. Well, I, that's very well said. And I obviously could not agree with you more, but I appreciate you saying it very, very much. Every now that's and then, man. Every, every um, now and then the words come to me, but you know, yeah. No, I think more than more than every now. <laughs> no, thanks as always, Mark. Truly, oh, you know it. Right. Great conversation. Please come back. You know you're always welcome. Oh, yeah, you got it. And uh, legal dispatches, everybody. That is uh, Mark's uh, Substack. Yes, absolutely worth reading. Every newsletter is is uh, thoughtful and informative and a lot of fun. So thank you. Absolutely, man. Everybody, thank thanks a lot for watching tomorrow night. Fantastic artist, Doc Shaner. It's been a long time since I've talked to Evan uh, 101 and uh, looking forward to our conversation about his wonderful work in comics. And then Thursday night, Van Jensen will be uh, joining me as well. So it's been a good word balloon week, man. You know, we got we had uh, my buddy Bill Detloff talking boxing last night, had you tonight. And then uh, we got uh, we got Doc and Van coming up uh, to close out the week. So I hope everyone will join us for those conversations and more. And until next time, everybody stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. <laughs>